Welcome everybody to the BizHack Live Masterclass Series. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy. This is Masterclass 3 in Season 10 of Grow More in 24. I'm your host, um, and we have a really amazing session coming up. Uh, before I talk to you guys about that, I just wanted to share with you some exciting news. Um, I just came back from uh, Capitol Hill, where I testified in front of the House Committee on Small Business, um, talking about the importance of training sessions like this uh, being free and open to our small business community and funded by people, uh, by entities like Miami-Dade County, the government. Um, I, I know a lot of you guys really value this service. It's been transformative for you, and uh, it's only possible through a government uh, public-private partnership. So um, we, we won a lot of awards and gotten a lot of attention, and I was invited to Congress to basically tell them why these kinds of initiatives are so important. Uh, I'm really excited to welcome Barrett Ursek, the CEO of Holganix, here today, who's going to talk to you guys about discovering your X factor. Barrett is here as a volunteer, as all of our masterclass presenters are. So this is really about giving back. Uh, Barrett is a successful uh, serial entrepreneur and business owner, and he's learned a, a thing or two um, along the way. Uh, and the goal of today is really to share that with you. Um, we're going to talk more uh, about Barrett. He's kind of a a, uh, a little bit of a celebrity in the small business scene. He was uh, featured in one of the chapters of this book. We'll talk more about that. Uh, Vern Harnish's book, Scaling Up. Uh, but th that book is, um, you know, one of the Bibles of small business growth and, and Barrett's featured in it. So we have a little bit of a, a small business guru celebrity here today. Um, I also wanted to give you guys a bonus invitation. Tomorrow we're going to be doing at 11 o'clock, um, uh, at the link uh, right there. And um, uh, John, if you could please put that link into the chat so that people have it. Uh, this is a bonus masterclass we're gonna do on AI powered marketing. And we're gonna have um, half a dozen small businesses talking about how they are using AI in their marketing. Um, they're going to be very accessible examples, uh, things that you can all start doing yourselves. Uh, and the idea, and these folks were the graduates of a six-week course that we did um, with two dozen business owners uh, on how to market themselves using AI. So uh, it'll be both very educational and you'll get a lot of inspiration out of it. We hope you join us. Um, John, if you could also make sure to put the, the date and time, uh, since the time is at 11 o'clock rather than our normal 1230 on Wednesdays. So 11 o'clock tomorrow, um, try.bizhack.com slash AIM graduation, AI for marketing graduation. Um, I'm going to uh, do a quick survey of you guys. Um, we've, we've been asking the same question. So uh, those of you who've been to multiple master classes recently uh, may have uh, uh, recognized the questions. Please go ahead uh, and answer them. Um, one of the things that... Um, uh, we are promoting right now is a scholarship uh, to defray a large portion of the cost of our um, social media advertising using AI course. So um, we're going to be teaching it. It's our signature course. We're completely revamping it to incorporate all of the tools that have been built by Meta uh, into their advertising platform. Um, so if, even if you've taken the course before or you know how to advertise on, Mark, on, on Facebook, if you haven't used the Facebook AI tools, this could be a good course for you. Um, it comes with um, three one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. There is a small commitment fee uh, of $500 uh, to help defray the cost of those one-on-ones. Um, but this is 30 hours of live instruction on meta advertising um, with expert guidance. It's a very intense bootcamp style course um, and it's getting completely renovated for the first time in two years to reflect all the changes. The course normally costs $3,500. It's our most popular and longest running course. We've been running it for seven years for more than 700 businesses. Uh, and we're, we're offering it for just 500 bucks uh, with the $3,000 scholarship. Um, this is uh, a really great opportunity and we only have a few dozen of them and half of them have been taken already. So we're expecting to sell these out by the end of next week. Uh, the other uh, is that BizHack 
uh, is looking for partnering with more business support organizations. Um, I met Barrett through the Entrepreneurs Organization. I'm going to be speaking in Idaho about AI uh, in January to the EO, one of the EO chapters. And, and so EO has been a great partner uh, for BizHack, and we're looking for other partners like them. A business support organization could be a chamber of commerce. It could be a trade group. So if you're a part of a business support organization and you're willing to make an intro for me, uh, a lot of times there's no fee uh, attached with that. It's really just about furthering our missions, um, you know, because ultimately BizHack, more than anything else, is on a mission to help 10,000 small businesses uh, thrive. And the best path for us to do that is by partnering. Um, speaking of partners, I wanted to um, thank uh, our funder, the office of the mayor, Daniela Levine Cava, Miami Dade County. And Mayor Levine Cava has um, several initiatives that are designed to build the workforce of the future, what she calls future ready. Uh, one of them is the Strive 305 initiative, specifically geared towards small businesses. Strive 305 has a online virtual incubator where there are courses that you can uh, take for free um, and uh, Jose, I know you work inside of the virtual incubator. If you could put the link in the chat to where they can find some of the courses. BizHack has five courses in the virtual incubator, uh, three different courses, and one of the courses is in, in three languages. So that makes a total of five. Uh, we have Haitian Creole and Spanish. So if you're a Spanish speaker or Creole speaker, you should definitely look at our Creole and Spanish versions of the course. And then we partner with Miami-Dade Library who basically spreads the word about what, what, what we do. We're also sponsored by South Florida PBS, the local public radio state, the public television station. And then we've partnered with more than two, three dozen local community organizations, local business support organizations, whether chambers of commerce uh, or trade associations or the Miami Foundation to spread the word about the great service that we're providing. Um, I'm Dan Gretsch. I'm the host of these. Uh, I have a background in journalism uh, before I turned into a marketer and now entrepreneur. And uh, let's get going. So um, this masterclass series, uh, we actually started it during COVID. Uh, the first 60 sessions we did without any funding or support from anyone. It was self-funded. Uh, we got a lot of attention for that work. It was really helpful to a lot of people. And We've won some awards, but also we now have fundings so that we can sustain this uh, as a continuing offering. And it's one of the most important things that we do. So this unit is on business strategy, taking a cue from one of the great business leaders, Vern Harnish. It's called Discover Your X Factor. And we have the wonderful instructor, Barrett Ursek from Holganix. Now, Vern Harnish is one of the grandfathers of small business training. And he wrote a book called Scaling Up. And Barrett was featured in one of those chapters. So you can think of Barrett as small business royalty. He's a learn by doer, a uh, guy who runs a very successful company who has figured out, uh, I think one of the key secrets to running a successful business, which is called discovering your X factor. And we're gonna talk about that today. Uh, get some inspiration from some of the companies that taught Barrett how to do this and then show how he's applied this in his own business. So Barrett, as I mentioned, is a serial entrepreneur. His first company was started when he was 16 years old. It was a lawn care business. Uh, he's now grown uh, several successful exits um, and he's leading his third startup called Holganix. You'll hear more about his background when he presents. He's also become a really sought after speaker at MIT, the London Business School, the Indian Business School. Uh, and he wrote a Harvard Business Review article, Breaking Your Industry Bottlenecks. But as you're gonna see, you know, Barrett and I are from the same hometown of Philadelphia. Uh, and he's a real, like I can be a little bit nerdy. I can be a little pointy headed. I went to Princeton, yada, yada. This, this is a salt of the earth dude who has learned by doing uh, I find you so appealing, Barrett, as a um, really inspiring uh, person. And, um, you know, I really appreciate, you know, you taking the time uh, out of growing your business to help our, us grow ours. So welcome, everybody, Barrett Urset. All right. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate the opportunity to, um, to share some of the things that I've learned over the years 
uh, by doing the strategies we're going to talk about today. So I don't I don't come at this from a perspective of um, you know I'm a consultant I'm a teacher like these are all good things that we learn in in a, in a book or or in a program although obviously we're learning them in this program here today but the my teaching that I'm going to be uh, going through with you today is stuff that I have actually applied in my companies over the last thirty years and built and sold two companies using these strategies created lots of value doing so and I'm on my third startup now. Uh, called Holganix that um, you heard uh, Dan talk about. And again, we're using these strategies in my current company to scale significantly. Um, so, you know, understand that I'm coming at this from a point of experience, uh, not just uh, not just pure knowledge. Um, this is stuff we actually do. And and the, we're going to go through this X factor wheel, which which I've created to kind of illustrate the process that we're going to go through. So it's, uh, you know, essentially an eight step process that if we do it uh, consistently in our companies, we will have a culture of innovation and we will find exponential leverage and, and in fact have unfair competition, uh, un unfair competitive advantage over our competition if we make this part of our business routine. Um, and so we're gonna go through each one of these uh, quadrants and uh, give you examples of other companies uh, who have done this, uh, tell you about my company and how I've done it. And uh, my ultimate vision is that we have a workbook that goes with this. And if we had unlimited time, you know, we'd spend three or four hours in your company, you know, going through this very specifically with your organization. Um, but what I want to do for you today is basically explain to you the process, illustrate how to go through this process with your company. Um, and we'll give you links to our workbook so that you can basically go back with your team and take them through this process yourself. So today is going to be more of an illustrative uh, you know, kind of presentation on how to do this. And then the actual work of doing it will be something you should schedule with your team. Um, and, and you may scribble some notes down and, and do some of this as we go, but it, that's not how we're going to be. Uh, that's not the tempo of what we're going to do today. So talk about, you know, where this idea of the X factor comes from. So the definition of X factor comes from Bern Harnish. Uh, he was my teacher um, at, at a MIT executive ed program I went to that was sponsored by EO uh, back in 2000 and uh, heck, it was 1999, 2000 and 2001. It was a three-year program. Um, and Vern was our teacher and he, he introduced this idea of X factor and his definition is uh, of X factor is creative innovation that leads to a seven to 10 times competitive advantage. In fact, an unfair competitive advantage over your competition is how Vern would say it. And so that's what we're going to talk about is how to find that in your company and how to create a culture of innovation within your company. Uh, when Vern first introduced this to me, I was a 29 year old lawn care. I ran a lawn care company. So I like to say I was a 29 year old lawn boy. Um, I was not a sophisticated business person. I was trying to learn how to be a sophisticated business person. And that's why I went to this MIT program sponsored by EO. Um, and I was excited to be in this program. I felt out of my league being in this program, frankly. There's a lot of people, this was just before the dot-com bubble had burst, and there's a lot of people in the course that were doing really what seemed to be spectacular things in, in technology and, and, uh, and the internet and such, as, as you can imagine, you know, the times why, you know, right around that year 2000. Um, I walk in as the lawn boy trying to figure out how to scale my little lawn care company. Um, so I was humbled and honored and a little bit, frankly, uh, intimidated to be in the program, but, but uh, you know, Vern really was a phenomenal teacher. And one of the things that really inspired me was a three-year program went through lots of topics, but this X factor for some reason really stuck with me. Um, and when Vern introduced it to us, you know, this is kind of how he talked about it. He says, what's that one thing in your business or your industry that's just messed up? You love your industry, you love what you do, but it's that one thing that's messed up. It's the choke point, it's the constraint. That, a lot, that stops you and your competition from scaling your companies as quickly as you'd like to. It makes your, it adds friction to your industry uh, in, in, in all the leaders of your industry and how they grow their companies. If you could figure out that choke point, that constraint point, and you can find a solution, then you will get that exponential leverage, that seven to 10 times competitive advantage. Um, and that's what Vern introduced us to as an idea. At the time, remember, I had a lawn care company. We put down fertilizer, we killed weeds. We didn't cut grass or plant trees or do landscaping. We just did the chemical applications. And our biggest bottleneck I started to think about was our cost per sale. 
So when you wanted to get lawn care back then, you called us up. Hey, I've got dandelions. I want to get my grass green. We would come out with a guy and he'd measure your lawn length times width. We had to come up with square footage of your lawn in order to price it. We'd leave an estimate at your door. So did two or three other people because, you know, you called two or three companies. And then we'd call you back while you're eating dinner and try to sell you the service. Then we'd schedule the service and get it done. That whole process would take about three weeks and cost $275. So our acquisition cost for a new client was $275. So what do I mean by that? So that's all the money we spent on advertising. Uh, the the number of leads that came in, and then our close rate of those leads through this process, and paying those salespeople to go out and measure the lawn and do all do all the steps to get to the sale. So when you added up all those things, it cost us two hundred seventy five dollars every time we acquired a new customer. And by the way, Chem Lawn was our biggest competitor. They they had about the same cost per sale. So this was an industry bottleneck. It was a bottleneck I had, and so did my competition. And so I started focusing on that. And I said, hey, what if I could get my cost per sale from two hundred seventy five dollars down to $27. If I could do that, then I could really scale my company because I could, you know, we only had about $400 in revenue per client with a 50% gross margin. So it would take us six quarters in gross profit to pay for our acquisition cost. So the faster we grow, the less money we had. So it was always a, it was always a, a, a limit. It was always a constraint to growth. So if I get down to $27 instead of 275, then I could, I could pay for my customer acquisition costs very, very quickly. In fact, we could pay for them in you know, just a couple of weeks as opposed to uh, six quarters. And as a result, we could we could take our marketing dollars and spend them over and over again and, and uh, grow the company without a cash constraint around growth. So I started getting really focused on that question. And again, these are a bunch of dot comers that were all in the program with me. So I, I got them all and bugged them like crazy about this question over and over and over again. I mean, it got to the point where I would come to lunch and we'd all sit down at the table together and I'd sit down and everybody would kind of get up and leave because they, they were tired of me talking about the same thing over and over again. But from that question, we developed a process that used, and this is, remember, this is year 2000. So this was rocket science back then. Today, it seems pretty commonplace. But we used a combination of aerial, aerial photography, uh, tax map data, and GIS imaging to measure lawns remotely. Think Google Earth technology, but, but Google Earth didn't exist back then. In fact, we used to have to lease aerial maps from this company called Globe Explorer, uh, for fifty thousand dollars a year, just for one city. Um, so you know, today we get them free from Google Earth. Google Earth bought Globe Explorer. In fact, that that's the platform that became Google Earth. Uh, but we started using this stuff before anybody was doing it in our industry. It was like me and the CIA were doing this stuff. And um, as a result, you could call us up for an estimate for lawn care. We would give you an estimate right over the phone. We'd schedule you for service, and we would actually come out and service your lawn before our competition could even set up an estimate. So we would service your lawn within three days of your phone call. Um, and our competition would typically schedule an estimate within three days of your phone call. Um, so as a result, our cost per sale didn't go down to 27, which was my goal, but it went to 50. And so the difference between going from $275 cost per sale down to 50, because we didn't have to have those guys go out and measure the lawn. We had a higher close rate because we were the only people that could do that one step close. It was much, much more efficient. We grew the business rapidly. Um, and so we we use that tool to, in fact, revolutionize how people get lawn care estimates. And today there's three platforms that basically measure every lawn if you ever get a lawn care estimate for your for your home. One of them is still our platform that, that we've licensed out to other groups to, to use. Um, but we were the first people to do anything like that. And it totally transformed how I grew that company um, and, and, and eliminated that bottleneck. And so, frankly, I, I just got really excited about that, told Vern about it, and Vern put, us, put me in his book. And then people started asking me, hey, tell me how you figured this out and help me figure this out. And that's where this so, process uh, comes from. I just wanted to pop in here because what you're saying is, is really important. Um, go back two slides, please. One, one more. One more. Just I want to see the, there you go, the X factor. So the goal of today is to help you guys figure out your X factor. And if you can figure out your X factor, you're going to be able to grow your company much faster. Um, and what you're doing is you're solving something that is a perennial problem for you and your competitors. And I'm going to give you a, two really good examples. One is from one of the best X factors I've ever seen was one of our clients. Her name is Suzanne Delawar. And Suzanne is a wedding photographer. Now, I don't know about you, but every wedding photographer that I know 
takes forever to deliver the photos. Forever. And it's torture because you totally want to see the photos now. And the longer you wait, the less you want to see them. And so then what do you end up doing? You beg all your friends to send you their photos. So what did Suzanne do is Suzanne said, how could we deliver the photos the same night? And so she and her team brainstormed about this and they did a whole series of things. First of all, they would set up a headquarters where they would have a series because every photo needs to be touched up. It needs to be edited. It needs to be color corrected. You can't just send a photo raw. That's what takes so much time and it takes hours. So first you need to take photographs and then connect them to a cloud drive, right? So they had to have cloud connected, internet connected phone, uh, SLR cameras. Then you needed a person uh, who was available to edit those photos in real time. Uh, that person uh, was going to be on site. Um, and then at the end of the night, uh, they would ship those photo, the photos and videos to a team in India who's working on a 12 hour different schedule. And by the time the, by the time they were done after innovating in all these ways, the bride and the, first of all, they would give as the guests were leaving a flash drive with photos from the evening. And the next morning, the video was ready. So when the bride and groom woke up, they had the video from the night. And they they literally could charge anything for that service. You know, a celeb they be, they've become very famous for celebrity photographs. Um, and the celebrities would literally pay whatever it costs because the money isn't what matters to them. What matters is the immediacy of the photos. And then they would coordinate with the PR teams and the social media teams so that those photos could be live tweeted. I mean, it was it became like almost like a little mini newsroom, uh, you know, that they were instead of just your classic wedding photographer. That is an X factor that creates a category of one. Yeah. So for my business, sorry, you want to say something? No, I was just going to agree with you that they absolutely uh, gave them an unfair competitive advantage over their competition. Yeah. You know, and, and, and what it does is it gives you almost total control over pricing. In other words, you charge. You pick your clients and you tell them how much it costs. That's that's what happens when you do this, right? Uh, another great example of this, very similar. Um, I don't remember the business that did this. is is one day paint job. So you that's wow one day wow one day painting, which is an EO company. It's the same that's company it. that does. Uh, it's the same people that in, that came up with one eight hundred got junk, and they did wow one day painting. Yeah. So, what's the name of the company? It's it's, it's one day painting. Wow, one day painting. Wow, one day painting. The parent company is uh, 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 ordinary to O two E ordinary to excellent. That's their all their brands are, have that philosophy. And Brian Scudamore is the CEO. Uh, what's his name? Brian Scudamore. Brian Scudamore. If you could, um, okay, Brian Scudamore. So that another example was, you know, many of us have been in a situation where you're waiting. Uh, for days while your house is being slowly painted, uh, Brian Scudermore came up with the idea of painting it in one day um, and bringing like 30 people. And it was hyper expensive, way more expensive than the traditional. But there are people that have reasons that they need it painted quickly. Uh, maybe they're doing a movie shoot. Maybe uh, they just don't want the inconvenience of the painting. Um, and so that was another example of someone who discovered an X Factor uh, who was a category of one. And let me just give you one more example, which is from my own company. Hey, hey, hey Daniel, you know, um, the, the Scudamore, he sat next to me at the executive program at MIT. We we literally sat next to each other. Um, so it's fun, to, fun that you brought that example out of the air. We didn't talk about this in advance. Yeah, no, I just, I, I like I like when I met... It's funny when you hear about X factors, you know it. Like it's like it's like a boom. Like you recognize it right away. You're like, oh my god, why hadn't that been exist? Like why had why doesn't that exist? Like of course, um, it's it's like um, it's like a bolt of lightning. Like a, it, it, and you and you see them if you if you start looking for them, you'll see them everywhere. You know, and we're going to talk about many more examples than those two, but those are two that come immediately in mind, and then. Um, we're going to be taking you through that. You're going to get a copy of this workbook um, that we're going to, and, and I filled it out because that's how I met um, 
uh, uh, Barrett was by doing one of his workbook classes, you're going to have to fill out the workbook on your own, but it's incredibly valuable. And I found two X factors that I'm going to be attacking. Um, the first is, as I, uh, you know, most of BizHack's training is funded for funded by either governments or business support organizations who then give it for free or to really subsidize costs to small businesses. Why? Most small businesses can't afford it. They can't afford training of this caliber, so it gets subsidized or paid for by these organizations. But when I go to these organizations, Barrett, guess what they say when I ask them, hey, you want to partner and offer a, a, you know, a course together, what do they usually say? Yeah. We don't have the money. I'm sorry. We would love to hire you. We know our people need help with marketing, but we don't have the money. So that's like a bottleneck is they want the training, you want the training, they want to they want to do more better training, but they don't have the money. So one of the opportunities is what if I wrote you a proposal that's ready to be sent to your local bank? So you, and, spent, oh, you made it simple and, 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 and easy to get the funding. Just cut and replace your name for the name of the organization, the name of the bank for the, because banks have money. They call it the CRA, Community Reinvestment Bank uh, Act, Community Reinvestment Act, CRA. And so I, if I find like a really good template for a CRA uh, proposal, all the funding is funded locally and it has to be for a nonprofit. So I'm not eligible for it. So that's a bottleneck that I can unblock. And now you can have an AI course in your local community. So that's one example. Another example is if you speak to people in, this, in the um, business support space, one of the number one things they talk about is a lack of good data on their businesses. So what if I say, and the reason why is because businesses, business owners are busy and they hate filling out surveys. So what if I got you that data? Uh, the carrot is the training. The stick is the survey you have to fill out to take the training, the application. And so not only are you you upskilling them, but you're getting better data than you've ever had. And I, this isn't theoretical. Like half the reason Miami-Dade County hires me it's because of the data I give them. Because they don't have great data on their small businesses. I give them more insights than any other training provider, than any other partner. Uh, and so now they can leverage that data. So it's like, you know, I have a use case. This is a huge block. Anybody who works in the space will tell you they struggle with getting good data on small businesses because small business owners are distractible and busy and they don't like filling out surveys. So I can solve that for you because that is the, that's the gate required entry fee if you want to take a class with us. So anyway, um, back over to you, Barrett, but I just wanted to try to land this plane for folks and say, that's what you're in search of. You're in search of the one day painting. You're in search of the same night um, flash drive with photos and the next day a video. You're in search um, of, of solving, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the cut, uh, the, the, the find and replace funding uh, proposal. Your search for that breakthrough insight that will unlock the potential of your business and make you in a position where you can tell people, where you can choose your customers and tell them what, what you want them to pay. Yeah. And I'll give you an example, Dan. When I when I did solve that bottleneck, that industry bottleneck, I had an opportunity to sell my little lawn care company that I had started 11 years before that. And I had built that to a $2 million company by just working hard and and just you know getting up every day and, and doing my job. It was nothing spectacular. It was just a, a you know nuts and bolts, $2 million company that made a nice profit. I sold that company to Scott's, the fertilizer people, because I, I had this X factor figured out. And I thought if I could take six months off, take my money from the sale and really invest in this tool and make this tool work, this web tool to measure lawns, I could start another lawn care company up and be bigger than my other one in, in no time. And in fact, that's what happened. So it took me 11 years to get the first company to $2 million. The second company, we had broke two million in revenue within seven months from from startup. We went two million, five million, eight million, ten million. That's how we were scaling that business, and it kept on scaling. The frankly, we could have sold, we could have grew grew it much faster, but we 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 outsold our service capabilities over and over again. So we always had to stop our marketing spigot so that our service could keep up. So we'd actually service the lawns. That became the next bottleneck, and we had a bunch of bunch of ways that we tried to solve that. But my point to this is. My previous limitation to growth was my cost per sale. Once we solved that, we had unlimited growth opportunity and marketing and sales was, was no longer a, a, a bottleneck. Of course, we still had to service the lawns and that, that became the next bottleneck. But 
uh, that that really changed how we ran that business and, and made it much more profitable as well. Um, so that's how I got introduced to this. And so now we're going to take you through um, some other companies that we can show you that you may or may not have heard of. And so you can see how other companies have done that, done this. Um, before we get to the nuts and bolts of the presentation, give you some uh, some uh, resources here. We talked about this book, Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. Um, there's several versions of this book that Vern has published over the years. So depending on which one you look at, um, in the early one that I have, um, pages 132 to 134, and some of the newer ones that may be different pages, if you look in the back uh, in the appendix, there's they list my name and they list the company Happy Lawn. And so you can you can find it if it's not on those pages. Uh, but they but Vern basically tells my story in that book um, as somebody who used his tool and actually revolutionized his industry in a way. Um, so there's a link there that you can get this book. And it, to me, it's a it's a it's a user's manual on how to run a company. I mean, it's it's really a, a powerful book. Um, I actually wrote a Harvard Business Review article. And keep in mind, I'm a lawn boy who went to college for three weeks uh, and and has run lawn care companies. You know, two lawn care companies now. I'm, I'm in a fertilizer manufacturing company, organic microbial based fertilizer manufacturing. But my point to all this is I wrote a Harvard Business Review article on this subject because of the experiences that I've had. Um, I also connected with a professor, uh, Professor John Mullins, who helped me, you know, kind of, I guess, look a little more scholastic. I, I didn't know Dan back then, or I maybe I would have called him. He certainly could have helped me. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I actually got an HBR article. Um, and there's a QR code there that you can, you can uh, pick it up yourself. And the nice thing about the article is it's, it's a bit of a how-to. Everything we're going to talk about today is kind of written in that article on a step-by-step -step process. So it'll be a great way for you to review everything we're learning today. Um, there's a couple of evolutions to the process, and I'll, I'll point them out to you as we go through it, that the article was written, you know, five, six years ago, uh, well, 2015, so however many years that was. Um, and um, so I've evolved the process since then. So it doesn't totally dovetail everything we're talking about, but 85% of it will feel very, very familiar. And it'll take you through this um, and, and help you actually go through the workbook with your team. So this is our X Factor workbook that I created and I use in my workshops and my in my talks when I go and, and teach this. Um, QR code will take you to that workbook. Go ahead and download it, print it, get your team involved, fill it out. It's a very, very simple process. Um, you just got to sit down and do it. I, I like to say it's like doing sit-ups. You know, we know for sure we will have a result. The trick is you got to get up every day and 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 do the um and do the work and, and you will get the results from the sit-ups. This is about as complicated as doing sit-ups. Um, now it doesn't mean everybody's going to do it because you got to be consistent and you got to do the work just like six pack, a six pack ab and sit-ups. But if you fill out this workbook and you stick at this, I promise you, you will find some significant leverage in your, in your company. Um, so before we get to your industry bottlenecks, I want you to really understand the difference between industry bottleneck and a business bottleneck. So both are choke points, both are constraints in, in doing what you're doing, but you have to get your team really, really clear on this. If you're going to run your team through this process, they have to understand the difference between industry bottleneck and business bottleneck. If they don't, you will not get this process down. So this is absolutely critical. You get this really, really clear with your team. It's really simple, but it's it's really critical. So a business bottleneck is a bottleneck that you have in your company, but likely your top three competitors don't have it. So business bottlenecks are what consume most of our time. And if we're going to sit down with our team, they're going to, you're going to say, hey, let's talk about our industry bottlenecks, our industry choke points. And they are going to instantly tell you about all of the business-oriented bottlenecks because that's where they live and that's everything that they, they have to deal with. That's how they, they, we're fighting fires every day as, as business owners, entrepreneurs. And most of these fires we're fighting are in, in the what I call business bottleneck arena. So this occupies all of our time. Uh, especially if we're not purposeful with our time. And solving business bottlenecks is important. It allows us to frankly stay in business. If we don't solve business bottlenecks, we will go out of business. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not suggesting that business bottlenecks should be ignored. But solving a business bottleneck will only give us a small incremental improvement. Maybe we get 2%, 5% better, but it's not going to give us that significant uh, exponential leverage that solving an industry bottleneck will, will, will give us. So an example of a business bottleneck might be, boy, if I, you know, I'm, I'm in the fertilizer manufacturing business, right? So if I had the right warehouses in the right locations, boy, I could really scale my business much, much more efficiently. Well, that's a problem I have. 
But, you know, I compete with really big fertilizer companies and they have warehousing everywhere all over the country. So it's not an industry problem. But if I don't get the right warehouses in the right locations, I won't be able to serve my customers. So it is important. Um, but it's not um, it, it's important, but it's not uh, it, it's not where I'm going to get an ex, ex, uh, that exponential leverage. Yeah, it's 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 something that is a problem for you. Um, and it's usually like a staffing or operational issue um, that's really holding you back. So a good example at BizHack is. Um, you know, we are really looking for a project manager, you know, we're getting these big projects and I'm right now in the project manager role and I'm not doing a good job in the role cause I'm too busy or distracted. So that's an example of a huge, huge business bottleneck for BizHack right now. That is not an industry bottleneck because my competitors don't have this issue. They have project managers working for them. Right. And so that that leads us into industry bottlenecks, which is where and, and, and another example is like access to capital. Like many of you struggle to get credit lines, to get borrow money, to have money to invest. That's not a problem your competitors have. That's a business bottleneck. Another one is hiring, generally speaking, um, unless there's like a systematic hiring issue, which, you know, could be an issue. There aren't enough welders or there aren't enough, real, you know, of a certain type. Um, oftentimes, um, you know, your competitors are better at hiring and training than you are. So that's more of a business bottleneck. Unless there's just a, um, you know, hiring actually is a little bit of a bad example because it could be an industry bottleneck. Let me hand it over uh, to you, Barrett. But the point is, the best way to figure out if you have an industry bottleneck versus a business bottleneck is do your three top competitors have the same issue? Yeah, so... This is a key filter, but before we get to that filter, let me just really make sure you understand industry bottleneck. We talk about business bottleneck, bottleneck you have, it's, it's specific with your company. An industry bottleneck is a bottleneck that you have and so do your competitors. The entire industry has this bottleneck. Now, if you can solve that choke point, that's where you're going to get exponential leverage. Now, we, in order to do this well, we need to spend 10 to 15% of our planning time uh, strategic planning time. I don't mean all time of running company, but I mean, if you have strategic planning rhythms, I like to take 10 to 15% of that strategic planning time and carve it out and protect it for what we're going to do today around X factor thinking. If you don't do that, by the way, your time, your strategic, your strategic planning time will get eaten up by business bottlenecks because they will just consume it all time and all attention. So we have to be disciplined, just like the sit-ups. We have to be disciplined, get up in the morning and, and do that before the day starts and do our sit-ups. Otherwise, we'll never find time to do our sit-ups. So we have to do the same thing when we think about industry bottlenecks and, and thinking about planning for this. Um, solving an industry bottleneck will give us an unfair competitive advantage uh, over our competition, and it will give us that exponential leverage, that seven to 10 times competitive advantage. And again, when you look at the bottleneck, and, and you're sitting you're sitting with your team and they give you a choke point or a bottleneck within the industry, they think it's the industry, and you wanna illustrate this point, you just go back to them and say, listen, do our top three competitors also have this bottleneck? And if our top three competitors do not have the bottleneck, then you can be sure it's, an, it's a business bottleneck. Doesn't mean we shouldn't solve it, but it's not gonna give that exponential leverage and you don't want to spend time in, in your X factor thinking in dealing with business bottlenecks because they will consume your time. Write them down on a piece of, I like to make a parking lot. Write down all your business bottlenecks that people want to talk about through this process and, and put, them on a, put them on a big sticky on the wall. Agree we're going to deal with these things, but while we're doing innovation thinking, we don't want to be dealing with these things. So it's a really good way to get, allow your team to get them off their chest. Tell them we're going to take care of them, but let's focus on industry bottlenecks only while we're doing this. And again, an industry bottleneck is a bottleneck that you have and so do your top three competitors. If you have a bottleneck that your top three competitors also have, that's where you want to focus. And again, right now, we're just looking at the bottleneck. We're going to teach you how to turn this into a, a solution-oriented uh, uh, process. But, but first, we got to find the choke point. So the way we find the choke point, and you know, we, we all get into our businesses and our industry, and we get very kind of tunnel vision because we do the same thing over and over again. We have a point of view that's very specific with the role we play in the organization, how we participate in the organization, and sometimes it's hard for us to get out of our own way. And so we develop this process around these diagnostic levers, and it allows us to have an empathetic lens 
from other stakeholders within our value chain and see where is the business broken or the industry broken from other points of view, not just the myopic point of view that we may have as a sales leader, as a production leader, um, what, whatever the, the role is of the executive. So we're going to go through those diagnostic levers, and that's the next uh, that's the next step in this process. So we're on to step two. Now, remember I said that the article was written, and, and you'll see a few differences. So when the article was written, we had five diagnostic levers. Today, we have six diagnostic levers. So you'll see the number five, you'll see the number six. Um, it's evolved, and AI is a big reason for that, and we'll get to that. But when you look at the article, don't get confused. There are, there are indeed six, and we're going to go through them, but you may see some references to five. So let's talk about um, how, how we're going to, when, when we do this process, we're going to look at our, our empathetic lens of, through six different points of view, and we're going to go through those in a minute, and we're going to list five bottlenecks from each point of view. So we're going to have a big list. If we go through all six, we'll have 30 bottlenecks. And which is good. Doesn't mean we're going to attack every one of these, but it's a way to get a lot of ideas on a piece of paper and, and have a lot of discussion around the choke points in our industries. And then from that, we're going to pick a few. So let's talk about the first one, the first uh, empathetic lens or the first uh, diagnostic lever. Uh, eliminating superfluous expenses. So this is pretty simple. Um, and sometimes when I first start to talk about it, people say, well, that's that's of course, that's overly simple. But but you know, hold off for a second, because there are real examples I'm going to give you where companies have solved this. Um, so look at your top five expenses on your PM. What are your top five expenses? And just imagine for a second. I'm not saying it's easy, I'm not saying it's gonna be, you know, it, it's gonna happen, but just imagine for a second that we could we could have your top five expenses be seven to ten times less than they are with the same revenue. Or the other way I like to look at it is, what if we could take those expenses and get seven to 10 times more revenue without adding any expense? And so it's a numerator denominator kind of a, a evaluation. And the reason I say that, let's most of us or many of us are gonna see labor as one of our top five expenses on our p &L. And we're gonna have our team sitting around a table trying to solve what might be labor, which might be them, right? They're looking at themselves, ah, you're gonna make seven to 10 times less labor. That means you know, some of these people might not be sitting here. You're not gonna get a lot of engagement around that. So what I like to do instead, and, and look, we're not, it's, not a, it's not about limiting jobs, it's about creating profit and growth and opportunity for everybody in the company. So instead of thinking about how do we eliminate labor or reduce labor by seven to 10 times, what I like to say is, okay, what if we could, what if we could get seven to 10 times more revenue per employee? Or what if we could get seven to 10 times more gross profit per employee or net profit per employee or some other financial metric that allows us to show that we've created much more value per employee? And imagine if we had seven to 10 times more net profit per employee, could we pay our people more money? Could we hire and, and attract and retain better people? Would it be more fun to go to work every day? It absolutely would. And so it doesn't have to be labor. I'm just using that as an example. It could be real estate. It could be product costs. But whatever it is, there are seven, there, there are five expenses that are going to stick out on your PL. I want you to write them down and I want you to start thinking about that numerator denominator equation around how can we make these expenses seven to 10 times better. So that might be lower cost, that might be seven to 10 times more result, but but you've got the idea. You know, retail location, you might say, our our, you know, we, we spend a lot of money in real estate for, for our rentals, right? So we could say, how do we spend seven to ten times less money in in, in real estate? Or you could say, how do we get seven, 10 times more gross margin per square footage of real estate? So that might be another way to look at it. So just giving you some examples. Now, here's an example of a company that actually did it. It's very simple, no, no big deal in the technology. It's, it's, you know, it's, they basically took a Coke machine that was, in, that was an innovation from 1923 and they decided to put DVDs into it. Now, when Redbox came onto the market back in uh, 2002, uh, Blockbuster, was the number one uh, video rental place in the in the country by by massive. Nobody was even close. So 2000, something like 87% of all DVD rentals or VCR rentals or whatever they were at the time happened through a Blockbuster store. By 2008, 64% of all DVD rentals happened through a Redbox machine, a vending machine, uh, like you see here. Think about that. Eight years, the incumbent, the the, the massive, uh, you know, eight hundred pound gorilla of the industry, went from 
almost all the rentals happen through them in their brick and mortar stores to two thirds of rentals happen through a DVD, through a, a, rent, a vending machine, a red box vending machine. In eight years, that, that's, that switch happened. And in 2010, Blockbuster went bankrupt. Now, imagine we're, we're running Blockbuster, we're part of the executive team of Blockbuster, and I'm coming in as the X Factor consultant, and I say, hey, let's look at your, your real estate. Let's, I mean, let's look at your P&L. What are your top five expenses? Surely they would show me real estate and labor. And if I went to them and said, well, how could we reduce your real estate and labor by a factor of seven to 10 times? You know, what do you think they'd say? Well, you know, many people that run big businesses like that would say, listen, we, we have the best real estate rates there is in the country. Like we get A space, we get A space for B rates. There's, there's no way we're going to get that any cheaper. Uh, our labor, we're paying on minimum wage. We have 1.5 people per shift. We should have two, but we, we've efficiency through efficiency. We've, we've gotten it that, that efficient where we can, we can run the stores with one and a half people. I said, okay, well, I'm not going to argue with these guys. But at the end of their hallway, they've got a vending machine with Coke, with Coke, you know, put your quarter in, your uh, dollar in and you get your Coke, Coke bottle out. The innovation was right at the end of their hallway. Redbox comes in, they've got no real estate cost, they've got very little labor cost. And as a result, you can rent a Redbox DVD for a dollar while Blockbuster was charging five dollars. You can, you can, you can check them out 24 hours a day. They're in the same strip centers that the Blockbusters are in, but they're they're in the grocery store. So you got to walk past the Red Box to get to the Blockbuster. They've had, so, they had so, such a competitive advantage over Blockbuster that Blockbuster became irrelevant and they couldn't adapt. They tried to copy this model, but by the time they, they, were, they were copying this model, they were just about out of business. And um, so it's a really interesting idea on how to, how to um, disrupt the big competitor by, in fact, taking out uh, your top five, you know, two of your top five expenses on your P&L with a very simple innovation, an innovation that came out in 1923, the Coke machine. By the way, I like to call this idea synthesized innovation. So you have your choke point, your bottleneck, and you say, where else, what other industry has solved a similar choke point, a similar bottleneck that I could, through R&D, rip off and duplicate, you know, maybe repurpose their innovation to help me with my industry bottleneck. So here we repurpose Coke machines, vending machines, put DVDs into them, and all of a sudden we've got a competitive advantage. So now let's take a look at um, another vending machine. I like this because it shows that, that idea of synthesized innovation. So here we've taken a vending machine and they're selling umbrellas. So this company's called Umbrella. They're, they're based out of London and, you know, it rains a lot in London, as you can imagine. And what they did is they, they have solved the bottleneck and you could say it's from P&L because maybe they have no, no real estate or labor cost here, but, and, and many bottlenecks will serve, could serve in, in multiple, uh, diagnostic lever, you know, kind of columns. And that's okay. If you write, if you write down, you know, that it fits in the PL and it fits in the customer, uh, the, the next one I'm going to go through, which is uh, customer demand, then then that's that's not a problem. So Umbrella came up with this idea where they're going to put umbrellas in vending machines. Because when it rains, you want an umbrella at that moment. And you, in fact, you must have an umbrella at that moment. But you know, you know, not everybody carries umbrellas around them all day long. They just want it when it rains. That's the only time they want an umbrella. So when it rains in London. The people who sell umbrellas want to get umbrellas to the customers. The people who are getting wet, they want an umbrella as quickly as possible. Umbrella, umbrella figured out how to solve this problem by putting vending machines with umbrellas in them on busy intersections in London. Now, there's a little trick to that. It wasn't just putting a vending machine out there. The other thing that, that Umbrella has done is they have a, an LCD screen that they sell advertising on. Because when it's not raining, they still have to pay to have this machine sitting there. So they're an advertising outlet when it's sunny and they put other people's messages on their, on their LCD screen. And then as soon as it rains, it's all about selling umbrellas. So they've got a dual revenue model there. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty cool way that they solved a, a bottleneck from a customer's point of view. What is it in your industry, what's getting in the way from your customers getting what they want, when they want it, in the quantity that they want it, as easily as they want it, the way Umbrella did with umbrellas in London. The next point of view we're going to look at is from a uh, psychological bottleneck. So what is in your, in your industry, what's getting in the way of your customers buying or using your product or service as much as you'd like them to, as quickly as you'd like them to, um, because of a psychological bottleneck? So it, it might be that they're confused, they're ashamed, they, they don't trust, they see a risk, uh, they're overwhelmed. 
Somewhere there's a psychological bottleneck that's stopping your customers or slowing them down. It's adding friction to the business model from buying your product services quickly and not just you, but everybody in your, in your industry. So let's take a look at a psychological bottleneck that um, helped the company solve. And, and as a result, they grew incredibly fast. So the wine industry. Um, in the first part of the 2000s in the U.S., the average store that sold wine had an average number of different choices of wine you could buy of 162. So there was 162 different bottles of wine on the, on the aisles of a wine store, everything from box wine to jug wine to things like this bottle of Louis Latour that you see here on the right, on my right hand side. So this company called Casella Winery, which is the parent company to Yellowtail, which is the other bottle of wine you see here. They came into the wine market in the first part of 2000s in, in North America. And they in fact became the fastest growing wine brand and, and the number one selling wine brand in the United States by 2010 from nobody ever heard of them in 2000. Well, how the heck did they do that? We had 162 choices. So we needed 163 choices. Well, clearly we did because they came in the 163rd choice and that was the one that became the fastest grower. How'd they do it? Well, what they did is they figured out that there was a psycho psychological bottleneck in the wine industry. You see, I mean, you had the cheap wine. Like, we don't care what it tastes like. We want to get drunk cheap. Okay. And, and that's not Yellowtail. Some people might say that if they're wine snobs, they might say, well, that's Yellow. No, that's not Yellowtail. Yellowtail is not the cheapest bottle of wine in the store. It's, it's about twice the price of the cheap or even three times the price of the cheapest bottle. That jug wine, box wine, that's a different market. The rest of the wine industry catered to what I call the wine snob or the wine connoisseur or the people that really knew what they were talking about, about wine. And that's, Frankly, that's most people that produce wine, which is why a lot of the bottles look like this bottle of Louis Latour. Now, this is a, you know, this is a $200 bottle of wine. This is a, a Louis Latour Grand Cru, comes from a very specific region in France, a very specific year where the vintage is just perfect. And if you're a wine connoisseur and you read Wine Spectator, oh, you get all excited over this bottle of wine. And in fact, Louis Latour has 27 words. If we could actually look at this, this label and blow it up, there are 27 words that Louis Latour uses to describe why you want that bottle of wine over any other bottle of wine in that store. And by the way, there's about 140 other wines that whether they're $20 or $200 that all copy this model. They want to know the year, the vintage, the region, all the reasons why we want to buy their bottle over another. Now, if you've got 140 people all bragging about the same things, there's a few people that will know the exact region, the exact year, the exact vintage, and those wines will be the, 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 the pinnacle. Everybody else is getting lost. And if you're not a wine spectator reader and you're not a wine connoisseur, you go and look at all these wines and you are totally confused. You want to bring, you want to buy a bottle of wine. You want to bring it to a party. You want to look good. You want to have fun. You want to drink a nice bottle of wine. Maybe you don't want to spend $200 and you don't know how to read all these labels or even make sense of them. It's overwhelming. It's confusing. So instead of buying that bottle of wine, now you, maybe you go buy a case of Heineken or, or a bottle of a, you know, vodka, nice vodka that you can buy. And as a result, there's a whole bunch of people that wanted to buy wine, but they didn't have, and they weren't getting sold to. Yellowtail comes in. Kissil is the parent company. Yellowtail is the brand. Now take a look at that label. How many words are on that label? There are three words on that label to describe why you want that bottle of wine. Three. Yellow, tail, Chardonnay. That's it. There's a few words at the bottom, but that's just legal mumbo jumbo that they had to have to sell alcohol. So think about it. We've got 27 words with Louis Latour. We got three words with Yellowtail. Not only do we not know what region it's from, we don't actually know what country it's from. It's probably from Australia because it's got a kangaroo on it, but we don't really know if it's from Australia. Okay. So Louis Latour tells you what region in France they're from. Yellowtail doesn't tell us what year it was made, doesn't tell us what region it was grown, doesn't tell us what even country it came from. Just Yellowtail Chardonnay. Yellowtail is fun to drink, easy to drink, easy to buy, consistent, easy to drink in wine. As a result, they tapped into a market. Everybody that went into that wine store that wanted a decent bottle of wine but was confused and overwhelmed had no choice but go buy a Yellowtail. And they changed how people interface with, with wine brands and, and actually opened up to a whole new market of people who weren't buying wine. And as a result, they became the fastest growing wine brand in North America in the first part of 2000s and, and is today the number one selling wine brand in the United States. So psychological bottlenecks. What's getting in the way of your customers buying your product or service 
from a psychological perspective. They're overwhelmed, they're afraid, they're ashamed, they're confused, they don't know, they don't trust. Think about that. Now let's go on to our, our fourth diagnostic lever, which is winning hearts and minds. So I like to, and, and by the way, if you look at the HBR article, you'll see disengaged employee, because this started off as disengaged employee, but I've, I've taken a broader stance on this now, which is there's other constituencies besides employees that we wanna win hearts and minds. It could be a disengaged set of employees, or it could be a key referral source, or it could be um, an influencer, or it could be a, a key uh, labor from a, from a subcontracting perspective. What's that group though? If you won the hearts and minds of that group, you would have a big advantage over your competition. So before I get to this example, I'm gonna give you an example that you've all seen. It's so simple and you're, you probably all interface with them. You know, I, I interface with them once a week, Chick-fil-A. So Chick-fil-A does twice the revenue per square foot and twice the profit per square foot that McDonald's does. And they're only open six days a week because they close on Sundays. McDonald's is open seven days a week. They're open early in the morning, late at night. Some of them are open 24 hours. Yet Chick-fil-A does double the revenue per square footage. How do they do it? Every time you go to Chick-fil-A, you have a pleasant experience with people that really care about the food they're giving you. And they say with pleasure, even at the end of the experience. Every time you buy Chick-fil-A, they say with pleasure. Say thank you, with pleasure. Notice that next time you go to Chick-fil-A. Notice the people that are preparing your food at Chick-fil-A. You go to McDonald's. You, you, it's best that you don't notice the people that are preparing your food. You, you, you just, just kind of shut that out and pretend you don't notice. And I'm not saying anything bad about people working at McDonald's. I worked at McDonald's when I was 14. But what I am saying is Chick-fil-A has gotten really, really good at getting the best of the, you know, kind of that entry-level fast food worker to want to work at Chick-fil-A. People will work at Chick-fil-A before they work at McDonald's. Chick-fil-A does not have a labor problem. McDonald's has a labor problem. As a result, Chick-fil-A... Is out, is out doing because they won the hearts and minds of that entry level fast food worker and they give them actually a career opportunity to do so. It's one of the reasons why they they, they help with with uh, scholarships, they help with creating franchisees. You have to work at Chick fil A to be a franchisee of a Chick fil A. Um, so, in any case, hearts and minds, what's the key constituency that if you could grab and, and win the hearts and minds of that key constituency, you would have a competitive advantage? So, if you're in the software business, it's that, it's that high-level programmer. How do we get the best high-level programmers to make sure we get them? If you're running a CPA firm, do you have enough certified public accountants? Probably not. How do we make sure that everybody that comes out of school that's the best certified comes to us? That's going to give us that key labor force. And there's, and there's a lot of examples of companies that have done that. One that I like because it's an EO company, it's a, and again, this was in our, I went to that MIT program with the Van Vern Harnish thought. Brian Scudamore, you heard about Wild One Day Painting and One Day Junk, he sat next to me. And then another guy who sat on the same row was a guy named John Ratliff, who started this company, Apple Tree. So this is this is the dumbest company ever, right? Not the dumbest, but it's a it's an incredibly simple company. What does Apple Tree do? They answer the phone for plumbers and doctors and and people when you know you need twenty four hour kind of phone answering. They provide that, so they're the they're the office when you can't answer the phone. And they have to staff 24 hours a day to be able to answer in the middle of the night when there's emergencies and that type of thing. So when John came to the MIT program, I was talking to him about bottlenecks, industry bottlenecks. And he's telling me, I hate my industry. I hate what I do. And I want to find something else. So I said, well, why do you hate it, John? John says, well, we have 250% turnover. So that means frontline for a frontline position, the person answering the phone. Everybody that he hires... He has to hire two and a half times every year for one position. He's all we do is, is interview, hire, train. And then, you know, as soon as we got somebody working, we have to interview, hire, and train again because that person is going to be gone. Nobody sticks around. As a result, we have very mediocre people working for us. We have very mediocre service. We can only compete on price. And by the way, that's not just my problem. That's everybody in my industry. I was just at a trade show and, and everybody was complaining about the same thing. So I started talking to John. I said, John, what if we could retake your labor? And what if you could do it from 250% turnover per year and go down to 20% turnover per year. Would, would that change your, your way you go to work and, and what you feel about your industry? He says, oh man, that'd be unbelievable. If I did that, then I could really afford, because he was spending, by the way, every time he had to hire and train and fill a position, he would spend $5,000 in, in all of his resources to, to get that person into that seat. But that person would just last three or four months. He says, boy, if I could keep them for, for a longer period of time, then instead of spending five thousand to hire and train and 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 rinse and repeat, 
I could invest in my people. I could pay them more money. I could actually train them and make them better and better at the skills that they do. Um, it could be a really interesting place to work. And so John got totally focused on that, on that. How do I go from 250% turnover down to 20% turnover? How do I win the hearts and minds of my frontline employees and get them to really care about working here in the middle of the night and answering a phone? And if you, um, if you write this down, go to uh, YouTube and just uh, type in apple tree dream on and you'll see a, a, a video come up. It's an 11 minute video. It was cut by his employees to talk about what it's like to work at apple tree. They got voted best place to work uh, in the country one year, uh, be, uh, uh, beating out like companies like Mattel and Google. Um, and this is a phone answering business. John did a whole bunch of things to help help improve uh, morale and, and, and what it's like to work there. One of the things he did is he created a Make-A-Wish Foundation type, type of initiative where he realized that these frontline workers had really tough lives. And he said, look, I can't promise you we can fix everybody in everybody's life and give you give you give everybody a Mercedes. But if you've got something that's really tough in your life and, and you think we could help you put it in our little our little dream box here. We're going to put a dream box in every office. And if we can help make that a reality, we will. And so the first one that comes up in the in the dream box was a lady who was uh, she was in a domestic uh, violent situation with her house and her husband. She left the house with her kid and was answering phones to pay the bills, but didn't have enough money to even get an apartment, didn't have any credit. She was living out of her minivan. And once John, and she just wanted to help get an apartment. Once John figured that out, he, he got her an apartment, he helped sign for it uh, so that she had the credit backstop. He had furnished it for her, didn't cost a whole bunch of money, but he got her and he didn't ask for anything in return. He didn't ask her to talk about it, but she went back and talked about it to everybody. And it created a culture of, hey, here at, at Apple Tree, they really care about their employees. Since then, they have they have granted 400 dreams, everything from helping people bury their parents to, um, you know, taking uh, their kids to Disney World. Uh, you know, they had a sick one of the one of the team members had a sick kid who had a terminal illness and wanted to go to Disney World, um, and you know, took them, made sure they got to Disney World and, and had a, an awesome experience. Little things that didn't add up to a whole bunch of money but they changed people's lives. Um, and they really cared about that frontline employee. As a result, they did. They actually went down below 20% in their turnover. They only got rid of people that they wanted to get rid of. Um, their bottom line, uh, so in the, in the call center business, nobody wants to be in the call center business. So you can buy a call center for like two and a half times EBITDA. So earnings before taxes, uh, interest and, and amortization. So basically your net profit, if you want to think about it that way, two and a half times net profit is what a call center goes for typically. So John, once he figured out his labor problem, he was able to charge more money for answering phones than anybody else because he had quality people that could actually speak and take the message and be articulate and people you'd want to represent your brand. So he was top top of the market in pricing. His margins went way up because he was more money, but also because he didn't have to hire and train and 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 rinse and repeat two and a half times every year for every position. Instead, he had you know people stay in their job and he and he'd invest in them instead of hiring and training. His, his margins went way up. He then went and bought a whole bunch of other call centers. He rolled up the call center industry across the country and paid two and a half times EBITDA for these call centers all over the country. He then changed your metrics, got their EBITDA's way up because he ran them in his system. At one point, he had like a 750 seat call centers you know, across the country by rolling up a bunch of these. He then sold the company later for uh, like 13 times EBITDA. So he bought for two and a half times EBITDA. He grew top line, grew EBITDA, and then sold for 13 times EBITDA. I mean, it's a beautiful story. And they got voted, you know, best place to work in a, in a silly, tough industry. I mean, I don't mean silly like it's, but what I mean is silly, it's simple, simple, silly. It's not like he was high tech and, and, and you know, created the next, you know, kind of AI tool. And we just figured out how to take care of people that nobody cared about and make a difference in their lives. And as a result, they stayed around and, and gave him a competitive advantage. So Apple Tree, look it up, it's pretty interesting. So here's the, the fifth perspective is around, and this is the new one. So you could say it's the sixth, but I actually put it in the fifth position on purpose. And I'll tell you when I get to the sixth, why I did that. But if you look at some of the older articles, you'll see I have five perspectives and it didn't include data. But in today's world, data is so critical. And so how can we leverage or secure data in a way that our competition isn't doing? And so obviously around security, there could be big, big threats, big problems around security. Um, and if you can figure that out and how to protect on the security side, you might get some, some advantages over your competition. 
But the other is how can we use data to predict our customers' needs and to get in front of our customers before they even know they want us? And how can we use data to service our clients in a way that nobody else is doing? And I love this company because I'm from Delaware County, Pennsylvania, and Wawa is a Delaware County uh, institution. It was it, well, the Wawa uh, Dairy is first started in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. You see them in Florida today. They go up from Florida up to the uh, Mid Atlantic. They are best in class grocery, uh, uh, you know, gas station and sandwich shop and you know convenience store, best in class. Wawa's done a bunch of things right, but one of the things I've seen them do recently, and this is beta stuff, so you may not you may not have experienced this, but you're going to see it starting to hit you. They've got the app. They want you to go on the Wawa app and buy your your sandwich and your get your coffee from the Wawa app. They've gotten down now where they can they know what time you come and get gas because we all run the same habits. We all know how how often we get gas. We know what time of the day we get gas. They know that when you stop and get gas, you also get a coffee and a croissant sandwich. They know that they, 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 they've seen your buying trends enough that they start to be able to predict what you need and when you need it. So Wawa's gotten to the point now where they know when you're approaching a Wawa because of the geofencing and other things, they know that your car is coming and they know that usually on Tuesdays you pull into Wawa and get, a, and get a bacon, egg and cheese croissant sandwich and you fill up your car with gas. So they actually send you an alert that says, hey, we see you're near the Wawa. Uh, we've got your bacon, egg and cheese ready to go. Uh, if you'd like, while you're filling your car up with gas, we can bring it out to you or you can come in and get it and we'll have it for you. Just hit yes. And so they predict that you, they know what you want, they know when you want it and they're going to bring it to you while you're pumping your gas. So you don't have to actually stop twice and, and uh, slow the pump line down and all that stuff. So Wawa has gotten really good at using customer data to predict what the customer wants when they want it, even before the customer even might know that they want it. So how can you use data in your industry in a way that gives you a competitive advantage over your competition? Maybe it's through AI, maybe it's through, uh, you know, really understanding their buying habits, or maybe it's through protecting your data to make sure that your customers are protected. My uncle had a chain of plastic surgery centers and med spas and he got hacked. And, um, you know, it was a really fearful thing that they could have gotten into the system and used all these pictures from all these people and, and really exposed people. He was able to stop it and 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 build a, a much more robust system. But that's an example of where if you don't protect your data, it might be used against you. And if your industry is in a sensitive uh, data situation, and, and and if you're protecting it better than anybody else, that might give you a competitive advantage. The next diagnostic perspective that I like to look at is uh, negative externalities. So what are the unintended negative externalities associated with the growth of your industry? Now, sometimes this one is simple and, and it's obvious. And there's other industries like Dan's, you know, Dan's in the, you know, in the, um, you know, basically educating people around business and marketing and such. There's not a lot of negatives in what Dan does. So it's hard to find that negative externality, but keep in mind, I've been in the fertilizer and chemical space my whole life. So it's really easy for me the bigger my industry gets, the more fertilizer and chemicals are out in the universe and affecting our waterways, the Everglades, the Chesapeake Bay, what have you. And so I can easily look at, well, I love making grass green and plants healthy, but at what cost to the environment? I don't mean to be a polluter, but our industry by nature has a negative byproduct of pollution. So if you can look at your industry and say, is there anything that as our industry grows, an unintended negative consequence associated with the growth of this industry? And by the way, you saw this happen with Apple and Foxconn. I uh, remember when Apple, you know, they're an iPhone business, the iPad business, what, what have you. So what do they do? They get factories in, in China that subcontract and assemble our iPhones with a bunch of people with their fingers. Well, they, they were driving cost efficiency so hard at Foxconn, which is Apple's main supplier, that people were literally jumping off of the, off of the uh, out of a 10 story uh, tall buildings, jumping out and killing themselves because it was so terrible to work there. Well, that got that that press got out. This is about five, six years ago. That press got out, and all of a sudden, Apple had a problem, and they better get ahead of that problem. If they don't, there might be a national, you know, it could be a, a worldwide boycott of uh, Apple products, and we all might switch to another product that cared more. It didn't happen. Apple got in front of it. But I'm I'm using this as an example that you might think you don't have a negative externality, but Apple didn't mean to hurt people or, or put people in terrible working environments. They just wanted to make their phones cheaper and better and faster. Foxconn was the provider, but they were linked to Apple. So what are the, the negative externalities associated with the growth of your business or your industry? 
And I like to use this example of Tom's because I think it's one that everybody's interfaced with. Um, so Tom's buy a shoe today, give a shoe tomorrow. That's actually why it's called Tom's Shoe. You've probably seen them in the in your you know retailers and you know probably have uh, people in your family, if not you, wearing Tom's shoes, buying Tom's shoes. How did that brand even get to market? What's really cool is back in 2008, Tom's Shoe was just a little tiny company, you know, doing 10 million in revenue. And their concept was buy a shoe today, give a shoe tomorrow to somebody in need of shoes. And he was thinking specifically third world countries. And, and actually specifically, it started off as just a town in South America that produced shoes. And he says, hey, look, we're going to produce shoes that look like these shoes and using some of their techniques and some of their people. And every time we buy a shoe, every time we sell a shoe in the United States, we're going to give a shoe to somebody in this town. So it's a sustainable you know, source of shoes. It turned into a, now a worldwide initiative to put shoes on people's feet that can't afford shoes. But every time you buy one, you give one. That's his model. And so think about who he's competing with at the time. He's competing with Nike and Adidas and, and, these, and Reebok and these companies that actually spend more money on sales and marketing than they do in actually making the shoes. And as a result, they've got massive brand awareness and it's really hard to compete with them. And Tom Shoe comes in and not only does he not have the, the sales and marketing budget that Nike and Adidas has, he has zero sales and marketing budget and he wants to build the shoe company with zero sales and marketing because he takes the sales and marketing dollars and he puts it into the shoes on the people in third world countries. Well, a couple of things happened for Tom Shoes that made it really work for him. One is uh, in 2009, he got a Super Bowl commercial, a Super Bowl. It was a $10 million company making shoes with no advertising budget and he had a Super Bowl commercial. How did he do that? AT&T wanted to link their brand. And at the time they were advertising Blackberry. So it tells you how long ago that was. They wanted to link their brand to a movement that shows that, hey, if you have an AT&T, you can do business anywhere and we can help you expand your impact of your co small companies. And we want to sell to more small companies. And in fact, here's this guy, Blake. Blake, tell your story. So there's Blake on the Super Bowl telling his story about how buy a shoe, give a shoe, and how AT&T helps him run his business from anywhere. He was on the Super Bowl. No money. Why? Because he had a, 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 a something that was such a feel-good that at t wanted to be linked to it. Think about Adidas and Nike. Not only are they spending way more money on sales and marketing, but in order to create the profit margin to spend money in sales and marketing, what do they do? They try to drive manufacturing costs way down. How many times have you heard about a shoe company or an apparel company getting in trouble because they, they get stuck into a sweatshop situation in a third world country? So not only is Tom Shoes not taking advantage of third world countries and labor practices, but in fact, they're helping third world countries put shoes on people's feet. Second break that Tom Shoe got is he had a commercial in in live time, live like it, like uh, during the show of the Tonight Show with Jay Leno. So again, it's back 2009, 2010. Cameron Diaz, if you remember Cameron Diaz from something about Mary, she's big big star back in the first part of the 2000s. She was on Jay Leno, and, Jay, and she's on Jay Leno with a short skirt on, and her legs are crossed, and her and her legs bouncing up and down, and she's got her Tom Shoe on. And she looks over, Jay Leno looks over and, and Cameron Diaz kind of gives him a smack because, because she thought he was looking at, she, you know, he was looking at her legs. And in fact, he was looking at her shoe and then they got to spend the next 15 minutes of the segment talking about how awesome these shoes are and how she feels so good about giving shoes and kids in need. And all of a sudden she's got a 15 minute, you know, Tom Blake at Tom Shoes has a 15 minute commercial on the Tonight Show with a celebrity endorsement that he didn't pay for any of it. So Great example of a company that figured out how to not only not get involved in the negative externalities associated with their growth, their industry, taking advantage of third world labor, but in fact, uh, coming up with something that helped third world countries and gave people a reason to talk about them. So what is a potential negative externality associated with the growth of your industry? So now we just talked about our six diagnostic levers. And if we were actually doing this process with our team, we would have written down five bottlenecks from each diagnostic lever perspective, right? So we've got six, six levers, five bottlenecks in each. Now we've got a total of 30 bottlenecks on a, on a big long piece of paper. From those 30 bottlenecks, we debate with our team, what seems like the top five and just circle the top five. This isn't an exact science because there's so many there. Some of them are gonna seem absurd. It'll be easy to eliminate some, but there'll be a bunch that look like, well, maybe we should attack those. How do you pick the one that is, that's right for you? Well, it's not, it's not a simple process. It, it is a simple process. It's not a scientific process. 
you basically, as a team, you debate which ones seem like either they have the most value. If we solve these, we get huge value. Or maybe the DNA of your organization is just particularly suited to this bottleneck. So as an example, you remember my original bottleneck with my lawn care company was around my cost per sale. Well, my first job ever was doing sales and marketing, telemarketing actually, for Chemlon, which is my biggest competitor in the lawn care space. So I, I had a perspective of the sales I was always involved in sales more than I was involved in production. So, you know, as I had the DNA to think about that cost per sale, you know, it was kind of where I thought about all the time. So, so maybe it's something that you have a unique perspective in as a, as a company and part of your DNA. Maybe it's the, where you see the, the juiciest juice, the juiciest, uh, you know, kind of meat is, is going to give you the most advantage, but one way or another, you'll pick your five bottlenecks. And I you got your list of five and I like five, because basically we're going to take those five and we're going to, we're going to bring it down to one bottleneck and we're going to work on that bottleneck for a quarter, for two quarters, for three quarters. But if we have a list of five, once we get through that bottleneck, we've got enough to, even if we went through once a quarter, we've got enough to get through the next year and, and into the following year. So it, it gives us, we've got, we've got a nice, a nice, you know, kind of chunk of work to do if we can get it down to five good bottlenecks we want to work on. So it, it's, once we come up with our five bottlenecks, we then want to bring it down to our number one bottleneck that we're going to go work on first. Doesn't mean we're not going to work on the other five or the other four, uh, but we're going to, as a team, we're going to focus on one bottleneck. But you got to make sure you don't get paralysis analysis, or as my grandfather used to say, constipation through contemplation. You got to take massive and immediate action on this stuff. If you get if you get lost in just thinking and talking and pontificating, you're not going to get to the meat of this. So avoid that constipation through contemplation. But get down to that one bottleneck that you're going to go get to work on. And it doesn't matter if you pick the right one or not, because you're going to get you're going to go through this process over and over again. Eventually, you're going to get to all five that you picked. So you can almost close your eyes and pick one. Once you pick one, though, then as a team, now we got this bottleneck. It's a kind of probably a fuzzy, big bottleneck. I'll give you an example. I had a friend of mine that was a home builder. Uh, this is back when the we had the housing crisis. And he says, I said, what's your bottleneck? He says, nobody's buying houses. I said, okay, so we just got to figure out how to get seven to 10 times more people to buy houses. He's like, well, that's, that's too big of a bottleneck. Nobody's buying houses. So I just said, I said, okay, well, so I, and this is really good if you do this with your team, you actually role play. You actually do this out loud and, and you write down every answer. And you say at least five times, you say, well, why is that a bottleneck? Nobody buys houses. Well, okay, I ask him that. He says, well, because the economy sucks. I go, okay. Well, why does the economy sucking uh, makes you know prevent nobody from buying a house? He's like, well, and I think like nobody buys like somebody's buying a house. He's like, well, yeah, but even people that want to buy a house, I asked him why five times. He eventually gets to even people that want to buy a house are not getting approved for mortgages because the the lending has gotten so tight. I said, oh, okay. So if we just figured out how to get seven to ten times more people approved for a mortgage, maybe maybe then we could have a competitive advantage if nobody else is thinking about that. And so he came up with a bunch of programs where he basically took people who couldn't get a house and they were on the edge. You know, they went from maybe only a credit could get a house and a mortgage. He would take his B plus credit people, try to get them a mortgage. They wouldn't get it. He would then stay with those people and, and partnered with a credit counseling group that could actually take you through a 90 day process to improve your credit scores. In the meantime, uh, you know, he would take you, he would allow you to reserve your house. Nobody else wanted houses anyway. And, um, he, he basically was able to, to survive through the, the housing crisis. But it started off as the economy sucks down to how do we get seven to 10 times more people approved for a mortgage? So, and we got up there by asking why five times. That's what we call it why five. So you just keep saying why. Well, why is that a problem? Well, why is that a problem? And if we keep doing that, then what happens is we get, we go from this very fuzzy thing down to something that, oh, okay, now I see we can actually attack that. So it gets, it gets much more granular by asking that why five. And ultimately, what we want to do is get it down to a metrically driven problem. So not just the economy sucks, but he actually said out of 23 people that applied for mortgages, only two got applied or got approved. OK, so how do we go from two getting a, people getting approved? Um, and, and this is in a month. How do we go from two people getting approved in a month to 14 people getting approved in a month? So we were able to get it down to a metrically driven question. And we got it by asking why five? We could get it down to something that we could start to put some KPIs, key performance indicators, you know, metrics that we could start to think about investing in to make things 
seven to 10 times faster, seven to 10 times cheaper, seven to 10 times better. Um, and that's, that's that whole process of asking yeah. five gets us there. Yeah, I, I wanted to jump in here because this is actually one of the most powerful uh, tools in all of business. This what we what I call the why chain, and um, I have an interesting little story about this. When I was I spent twenty years as a journalist, and um, I discovered the what, what I called the why chain, which was. Um, asking people why they do what they do. Why is it important to you? Why do you do it? Who taught you to value that, et cetera? Um, this why chain uh, was a journalistic practice of mine. And it, the reason I did it is because I got really beautiful emotional quotes out of people whenever I did it. And I just kept asking like, you know, why Barrett do you, you know, you're running a successful business. You're really busy. You have a family and employees. Why do you teach? Why do you teach? Why do you teach? And eventually... We'll find out it's because, you know, maybe his family was a school teacher and that's why he does it. And and he'll talk maybe about uh, an anecdote from his childhood about like being the recipient of te great teaching. And um, or maybe it's because he uh, n never received a formal education. He was always struggling at school and he realized that the the problem with school was that it wasn't really built for entrepreneurs like him. And, and he was bored and he was um uh, he wanted to, uh, you know, help entrepreneurs who were like him, um, you know, learn better. So, so it was like a journalistic technique. It, it's at the core of what I call the 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 story of me uh, and your core purpose, the the business story. It's the signature technique of BizHack. It's the foundation of your business. But then I learned later that this technique that I'd kind of stumbled on as a journalist was actually pioneered by Toyota. Uh, some of the most important business principles actually come out of Japan, and um, they call it root, root cause analysis. And root cause analysis is, okay, there's something broken on the assembly line. Why is it broken? And you keep digging into why, and you come at, out, down to the root cause of what's causing the breakdown. Otherwise, you might just be papering over the surface issue and not rooting out the actual deeper issue that's causing the problems. So this notion of root cause analysis was pioneered in manufacturing. And then Vern Harnish picked it up in scaling up, and he uses it as a way for you to identify your core purpose. Why do you do what you do? Why is it important? Why does it matter? And now we're incorporating it yet again as a way to get a metrically driven question. So my point is this why chain, this why five times, this root analysis, root cause analysis is one of the most powerful tools in business. Back to you, Barrett. Yeah, and, and Dan, funny you just stumbled over it. My dad was a, a teacher, principal, and superintendent of a school system. And my brothers and sisters all have master's degrees, and I didn't go to college. So it's always been a problem to my dad. And so me teaching... You know, it does definitely, you you just answered my why and you didn't know it. But but I did because there's yeah. no way, there's no way if you look at his resume, half more than half of his resume is about teaching and speaking. Like there's no, I guarantee you, if you meet a hundred journalists, excuse me, if you meet a hundred entrepreneurs, nobody's resume looks like that. Right. It was very obvious. And I know that Barrett hasn't gone to college. I know that Barrett... Um, is a kind of serial entrepreneur since age 16. But I but I knew everybody has a why that's either a positive why or a negative why, either because you're you admire and love your father and you want him to admire and love and respect you. And doing this work helps him feel like uh, like closer to you because it's so similar to what he did and what he loved. But also, you know, I'm probably not wrong about the other part either, which is that you probably weren't taught properly growing up. And it it, it left you dry. You know, it left you wanting, and now you're teaching entrepreneurs the way you wish you had been t teaching growing up. That's probably some truth in that too. Hundred percent. I barely got out of high school. And we didn't. We didn't have this conversation, Barrett and I. Yeah. But like, when you've seen as many whys and you've done done as much root cause analysis, like you can almost anticipate it. You know, based on the fact that like Barrett, and 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 so how? Just just really quickly, like how do I do this? Is 
my spider sense tingles when I see non-normal stuff. And when there's a bio, like his bio slide that had so much about teaching and giving back and speaking, I knew there was something happening there that's not your average entrepreneur who's looking to make lots of money. And he comes from a line of uh, educators. It makes sense. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool that you tripped over that and, and kind of warmed my heart a little bit. So thank you. Um, so now we get to the fifth step in our, in our X Factor wheel, which is um, where we really get to now. So far, we've just been doing all our discovery around bottlenecks, all the different empathetic lenses from the value creation uh, in, our, in our chain of, of value creation. Now we're, we're going to and then we eliminate from our from our 30 bottlenecks down to five, down to our number one. We ask why five. We get it now. We're getting it granular. Now we want to turn it into a metrically driven question. Now notice that I have not talked about solutions in anything. I'm just trying to identify the problem, get the problem to be granular, and then get the right question. And Vern taught me this. Vern said the power is in asking the right question. If you get the question right, the answer will appear. And so don't spend your time thinking about answers, spend your time thinking about questions and make sure that they're, you're asking the right questions. That was, I, it was some of the best advice I ever got. And it's a key part to this. So that's why I call this the essential question, because if you get it right, it's absolutely essential you get it right. And if you do, it will unlock all this value creation and innovation we're talking about. So in order to come up with the essential question, we have, we've gotten through that Y5 process. We've got it down to a granular uh, kind of problem that looks like we need to start to apply some metrics to. And then, we, and then we want to start to craft what I like to call our metrically driven essential question. Now, keep in mind, when we ask this question, don't, don't get bogged down with thinking, ah, geez, that's it. And I have to tell you, I, when I first wrote down my, ex, my essential question, which was, how can I get my cost per sale in my lawn care company from $275 down to 27. Now, when I wrote that, the first thing out of my head, or you know, first pop the thought bubble that came up into my head was, that's a stupid question. And if there was an answer to that question, somebody would have figured it out by now. I'm not the guy to figure this out. Like, like there's people that run billion dollar companies that I'm competing with, like they would figure this out. And I said, no, 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 stop that. I had to like talk to myself and talk myself off the ledge and say, just pretend that there is an answer. You might not know what it is, but just pretend that there is one. And so that's why I love this, this quote that I read somewhere. I don't know who to credit it for, um, but it's about innovators see what could be, not what is. And it's about asking the question, how can I find greater potential from every person, every situation, every process, every outcome, every experience? Just assume that there is an answer. Don't get bogged down with there, that that's impossible. Um, have a passion for possibilities and, and, and assume that there is an answer. So when you come up with this great essential question, again, it, it's, it ha you can't just say, how do I make my cost per sale seven to 10 times cheaper? That's not good enough. How do I go from where am I now to where I want to be? So you've got to have real metrics that you can apply to it. And if you, know, if you don't get them right, like my cost per sale was $275, and I could figure that out and back you into how I figured out $275, but if it was 282 or if it was 267, like, and, and I called it two set, that, that'd be fine. So you don't have to get this absolutely precise, but you, you have to generally know the metrics you're working on, or otherwise you're never going to get this. You're not going to be able to disassemble the process to figure out how to make it seven, 10 times better. So make sure that it's absolutely metrically driven and that you can measure the results. So once you start, once you get your question right, so how do I go from $275? for customer acquisition down to 27, then as I start to try different things, I can measure my results. If you, if you can measure something, then you can improve it. And so that's why it's really critical that we get the, the, this to be a metrically driven so that we can see, are we getting closer to an X factor with some of the things we're gonna try? So we, we talked about how we're taking the bottleneck, how we're asking why, we're, turn, we're applying KPIs and we're turning it into that metrically driven question. And if we do that, then we get our entire team. By the way, we're doing this with our team. Typically, I start with the executive team, not the whole company. So we have our four or five, you know, people that help us run the company that are, you know, they may be called chief or, you know, they might be called the, the chief uh, financial officer, the COO, or they might just be our right-hand person that does everything in the company with us. 
But we want to get those couple of people that can really influence the company. And we want to get them, everybody to, to go through this process together. And we want to get one single metrically driven question that everybody focuses on at one time. So remember, we had five bottlenecks, but we're only working on one bottleneck at a time. Don't fall into the trap where the, this, the person who's charged of sales works on a sales bottleneck and the person who's charged of production works on a production bottleneck. No, everybody in the company focuses on one bottleneck at a time and one metrically driven question. So we get our metrically driven question down. We all agree that's our metrically driven question. And we're all going to become obsessed about this metrically driven question together. And if we can get four, five, six people totally obsessed about the same question, then the power of all those ideas and all the experiences that all those people have over the next 30 days, you will be absolutely amazed at what will come back in the form of ideas. And to do this, I, I, what I say is you want to program your reticular activating system. So what is the re reticular activating system? It's part of your subconscious brain that basically filters what you unconsciously pay attention to. And you've seen the reticular activating system at work in, in your life, I, I'm willing to bet, in many ways. But an, ex an easy example is when you buy a new car. You know, I bought, a, I bought a new Porsche 911 and I got a very specific model and a very specific color. And I thought it was so cool and nobody else had it until I bought it. And then all of a sudden, at every traffic light, I'm, I'm noticing some version of a Porsche that looks like mine. And I didn't even know they existed before. Be why? Because I became, my subconscious brain became emotionally connected to that very specific Porsche, that very specific color. And I don't care if it's Toyota Camry or Porsche, doesn't make a difference. Point is, you buy that car, all of a sudden you see that car everywhere. Before you bought that car, you might have seen it once or twice, never paid attention. Your reticular activating system becomes emotionally connected to that car. I want your reticular activating system to become emotionally connected to your metrically driven question. And I want your entire team's reticular activating system to become totally obsessed about your metrically driven essential question. And how do you do that? This is a very complicated process. Not really. Um, and now this is a this is not a complicated process, but this is just like sit-ups. I do this for lots of companies all over the world, all over the world. Very, there's a very select few that actually do this and follow through. Everybody fills out their, their papers. Everybody gives me their 30 bottlenecks. Everybody even crafts it into a metrically driven question. So few actually do this next step and it's so easy to do. And I promise you, if you do it for 30 days, you'll be amazed at the result. What do you do? You get an index card, a three by five index card. You write down your metrically driven question on your index card. You read it to yourself five times a day before you eat breakfast, before you eat lunch, before you eat dinner, before you go to bed. That's probably the most important because you'll be dreaming all night long about whatever you last thought about. And one more time just for fun. So five times a day, you're, you have this little act of mini meditation on that essential question, not just you, but so do your, so do your, your executive team. And as a result, it will always be in the background in your head as you're thinking. And so you might be in line at Starbucks ordering your coffee and watch how they process your order. And it might actually stimulate you to think about something how you can apply to your business in a totally different way. But it'll be amazing if you get obsessed on the question and it's the right question, the answers will appear. And as the answers appear, you want to gather those answers and decide as an executive team, which ones you're going to take, take answers on, uh, take action on, I should say. So um, we're going to run a few minutes long, guys. I just put out the poll. Uh, I'd love to hear um, how we did today from your perspective. Uh, a lot of you have answered it already, and I appreciate that. Uh, and Barrett, thanks so much for um, kind of going a little bit longer with us. Uh, and uh, back to you. Yeah. And we're just about done on, on the process here, which the next step is, remember, we, we got our, we got our central, metric driven essential question. We got our team obsessed about it. Now we want to create an innovation rhythm within our company. So if we just do this process and write down the index card and then we and then we don't talk about it again, it's not likely we're going to go very far. We did all the hard work. We've got the, the metrically driven question on our on our written on our index card. Now we want to make sure that as a team, we're gonna we're gonna bring this up on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, so that we can create a culture of innovation within the company. And you know hopefully if, if you read Scaling Up, I'm a, I'm a student of Scaling Up, Vern teaches us about a meeting rhythm where we're supposed to have our daily huddles, which, which we do in our company. It's a, you know, it's a 10 to 15 minute daily huddle, could be 30 minutes. Um, and then we have our weekly meetings, which could be 90 minutes. They could be three hours, depending on what time of the year it is. And then we have our, our monthly meetings, which could be a half a day. And then we have our, um, 
uh, we, we went to uh, monthly, quarterly, and annual. And each one, it's a longer time period. And our annual meetings are usually two, two to three days off site. And so if you can just think about all that strategic meeting time that we have, 85% of it's going to be on business bottlenecks and all the fires we got to put out. Who the next hire is, how we're going to be a little bit better at delivering customer service, how we're going to be a little bit better at sales. And 15% of that playing time should be on innovation thinking and X-factor thinking. And it's really important that you protect and guard and isolate the innovation thinking in your rhythms, because if you don't, the other stuff will consume it. And again, it's just like sitting, sit, doing sit-ups to get six-pack abs. If we get up at 5 a.m. every day and do sit-ups, we'll get those sit-ups done before anybody interrupts us, before we go to emails, before we got to take the kids to school. Nothing will get in our way. And we got to do the same thing with our innovation thinking, protect it, and get a rhythm around it. And so here's how I look at it. And, and you can think about how your meeting rhythms work in your companies. But I look at, in, in our daily meeting, we spend five to 10 minutes where we just, hey, what's the metrically driven question? What's our essential question that we're working on this quarter? And has anybody come up with any new ideas? Just real quick. Doesn't mean we talk about it. Doesn't mean we get really deep in it. Just, just capture the ideas. Weekly, we spend 15 to 30 minutes. Hey, what ideas did we actually take action on? And are and has that have any of them been effective? Because by the way, we'll come up with 30 ideas to solve our metrically driven question. And of those 30 ideas, maybe only three or four of them are really effective. But we got to try a lot of different things to, in order to come up with the really, really exciting ones. And then monthly, we do 45 to 60 minutes and uh, and and so on and so on. But it's not it's not all of our planning time. It's not the majority of our planning time. It's a piece of our planning time. But we do protect it. And keep in mind, we, we have five bottlenecks. So what I like to do is in my companies, we always have a bottleneck that's alive. It's not the same bottleneck for years, typically. It's usually the same bottleneck for a quarter, two quarters, three quarters, maybe. But it doesn't last forever because eventually it's like squeezing an orange. You'll squeeze that orange, you'll squeeze that orange, and you'll get a bunch of ideas and a bunch of juice out of it. And eventually there's no more juice left in that orange. Well, So put that one back on the shelf and get your next bottleneck out. And by the way, we're looking for seven to 10 times competitive advantage, which is your X factor. I've I've come up with, you know, four different X factors in my companies over 30 years. So it's not like you just trip over these, you know, every quarter. But let me tell you something. Every time I work on a, 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 a metrically driven question that's tied to a bottleneck, every time we do that, and we've done, you know, probably 100 uh, different metrically driven questions in 30 years in my company. Every time we work on one, we get a little bit better at each one of those bottlenecks. So we're looking for seven, 10 times competitive advantage. Sometimes we only get two times better. So I'm looking for go from 275 down to 27 in my cost per sale. Well, what if in that process, I go from $275 down to $225? Did I fail? No, I just made it better. And so by actually going to work on these bottlenecks, you know, if you think about baseball, sometimes we're going to get a single. We're going to swing the bat. We're going to get a single. We're going to get the first base. Sometimes we get a double. Sometimes we get a triple, and every once in a while, we get a grand slam home run, which is where bases are loaded and we get four runs at one with one swing at the bat, and that's an X factor. But what I'm telling you is, don't be afraid to swing the bat, and don't be afraid to swing the bat consistently. Babe Ruth broke two records in the same year. He actually broke the record for for uh, home runs. He was the home run king and strikeouts in the same year. So he he struck out more than anybody else. He got more home runs than anybody else in the same year. Great Bruce secret. He swung the bat with enthusiasm more than anybody else did. So don't be afraid to swing the bat. And it's okay if you strike out. And it's okay if you get a single or a double. What's not okay is don't swing the bat. Don't go through the process. Don't protect your time. So create that, that innovation rhythm. Because let me tell you something. Today's innovation is tomorrow's commodity. So what you think is giving you a competitive advantage today will not be your competitive advantage forever. Eventually, your competition will figure out what you're doing and they will copy you. And the only way to stay consistently ahead of your competition is always be looking at your next bottleneck and your, X, your next essential question and your next X factor. So as soon as you figure out your X factor, what do you do? You put your feet up and say, hey, dishes are done. I don't got to do this anymore. No, you go right back to work. You create a culture of innovation within your company. And the way you create a sustainable competitive advantage is you always go back to work and consistently make your product and service better, cheaper, safer, more convenient, somehow add value to the world by solving problems in a way that nobody's ever done before.
That's what we get to do as entrepreneurs. And if we do it right, we happen to off, often become rel relatively successful financially because we've created a lot of value in the world. But we're not actually doing it, many of us, at least not me. I'm not doing it to go make a bunch of money. I'm doing it because I want to make the world a better place. I want to solve problems. And if I do that right, I get market share. I get gross profit. I get to hire people and create opportunities for others while making the world a better place. And that's what an innovation rhythm and an innovation, a culture of innovation is all about. That's what X factor thinking is all about. So go through this process. And that's why it's a wheel because it's never ending. It's a constant virtuous cycle. We are always trying to get better and better and better and, you know, get to work. And this stuff is not, is not complicated. It's not easy. It's like doing sit-ups. They're not easy, but they're not complicated. But if you do sit-ups consistently every day for a year, you'll have a six-pack app. And if you do this every day for a year, you will get competitive advantage that your competition doesn't have. And you'll make the world a better place by making your products better, cheaper, safer, more convenient, adding value by solving problems that nobody's ever solved before. And you get to be an entrepreneur, which adds value to the world. It's, to me, it's a great profession. It's a great place to be. So with that, I'm, I'm done my, my part of the presentation. Love it. Um, so uh, you can uh, stop sharing. Thank you so much, Barrett, you know, for today's presentation. And um, you're, you're a really uh, engaging uh, presenter and you, you know this topic cold. So um, I, we, we got really, really high scores um, from, from folks uh, saying just how, how valuable this was. Um, the reason that I brought you here was because you um, have really um, bottled lightning here with this. It's, it's a very simple process. Uh, and it can cause, you know, massive, massive growth. A lot of times, you know, we say we really want to grow um, faster. Uh, in fact, our mission at BizHack is to help 10,000 businesses grow faster. But, but I have never seen, frankly, an easier process to grow faster than this. Um, it's, it's absolutely something you all can do. Um, coming up with the idea is not easy. Executing against it is not easy, but the process behind it, it, it is quite easy, frankly. Um, so um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, what some of my ahas were uh, in watching this. Um, so number one, um, I think we do sometimes make our lives a little harder in business than we need to. Um, it's really much more about finding something to get obsessed on that's going to actually move the needle and focusing as much of our life force, our subconscious brain, our reticular activation in that thing that's going to move the business. I think a lot of us, frankly, emotionally get invested in the wrong things. Um, you know, a great example is a problem employee. If you have a problem employee, your business needs to move on from that person. But I guarantee you they're occupying a whole lot of your time and attention and energy. And that is a counterproductive force versus getting obsessed and emotional about your metrically driven question that's going to create an innovation that will help your company grow 10x much better thing to be emotionally invested in. So we are all CEOs, chief energy officers, and where we put our energy is where we get results. And I think this is such a productive way to put our energy into something, into solving a problem that none of our competitors have, have solved and that matters to our customers. Like in many ways, you've stumbled on the very core of what a being a small business is all about. What else are we here to do than to solve a problem for our customers? And even better, to solve a problem that no one solved before us. Because if we can do that, then we're going to do well and do good. Um, I want to end with a quote. Um, it's, of course, from Vern Harnish. There are no straight lines in nature or business. And I, I really love this quote uh, because um, business is bumpy. Business has ups and downs. Um, there are good years and bad years. I think Vern likes to say that every decade in business, you have two good years, two incredibly, uh, two incredibly good years, two incredibly bad years, where you're like, what am I doing? Am I going to even make payroll? And then you have six years that are in between. And you know, he's a guy who's worked with so many businesses. You can kind of um, assume that this is a rule of of nature. And it's interesting. You know, I've I've been at BizHack now. 
for six years. Um, I've had one really good year was this year. I've had one really bad year, which was the year before this year. And then I've had four decent years. And that's kind of matching the the four one one uh, is pretty much ex right on what Vern recommend what uh, Vern uh, expects. And so, you know, of course, the the big risk when you have a good year like I'm having this year is that you assume that next year is going to be good as well, when the actual chances are 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 twenty percent that next year will be good again, like really good. So, um, you know, I think you have to be really humble when you uh, are successful and you need to be um, cognizant that when things are rough, that this will pass. So with that, um, tomorrow we have our bonus uh, AI powered marketing showcase. It's at 11 o'clock. And then next Wednesday, we have our final masterclass of the season on financial planning that drives growth with Eric Cruz. Financial planning is absolutely the topic that most of us business owners hate and fear, uh, which is exactly why you have to come next Wednesday to understand what are the financial levers that will allow you to run a successful business. Talking about metrically driven questions, most of those metrics are often financial. With that, thank you so much, Barrett, and we'll see you guys in one week. And thank we'll you. hopefully see you tomorrow morning as well for the bonus session.